I will be lecturing on modern steel making. Modern steel making. The lecture uh, will essentially comprise of this steel classification. properties, history of steel making, history of steel making, which will be followed by steel making fundamentals, followed by steel making fundamentals and after covering steel making fundamentals, I will be covering practice of steel making, practice of steel making, and in practice of steel making, I will be covering one oxygen steel making. and subsequently uh, electric arc furnace steel making, subsequently electric arc furnace steel making. So, this will be uh, organization of the various lectures that I will be delivering to you. So, as such I will be starting first of all to tell you what is steel. The whole idea is that, so that you can appreciate the importance of steel in the modern economy. Now, the first point is that steel is an alloy of iron and carbon, alloy of iron carbon and it belongs to rather steel belongs to iron carbon system. A steel belongs to iron carbon system. Now, this iron carbon system has a unique property. is a unique property of alloying with several elements of the periodic table. With that I mean that there are elements like cobalt, nickel, chromium, vanadium, tungsten, molybdenum and name any other element. This iron carbon system has the capability to have some solubility of that element and it imparts an altogether uh, different property in the steel or you can call altogether a different material. <coughs> Third, this iron carbon system is also capable to create different properties by altering microstructure through heat treatment and deformation processing. So, this is somewhat a very unique property that this iron carbon system has. I repeat once again, iron carbon system is capable, rather I just write little bit, iron carbon system is capable to create, to create any desired service property. by altering microstructure through heat treatment and deformation processing. So, this is somewhat a very unique property that this system has. And fourth, which is very important that steel is recyclable, steel is recyclable and hence you can call it to be a green material. And hence, steel can be considered or can be called 
as a green material and that is very, very important thing. Uh, now, these above features which I have told to you, they have the most important engineering applications. That is the above features of steel, it makes steel as the most important engineering material. You will wonder that around two have two and half thousand different grades of steel are produced for different applications starting from constructional steel to automobile industry and to aircraft industry, which is a very high tech industry. So, what I mean that is steel being a very important material and it has very diversified applications in all areas of industry. So, that, let, let us now see what are the different types of steel are there. So, types of steel, essentially we can classify in two broad categories. The first is the plain carbon steel. Plain carbon steel, it is also called with the name mild steel or sometimes it is also called simply carbon steel. Another is alloy steels. In plain carbon steel, say carbon is the principal alloying element. carbon is the principal alloying element. In case of alloy steels, they also contain carbon, but besides carbon, the alloy steels have several, several other alloying elements. Several other alloying elements like cobalt, chromium, nickel, molybdenum, tungsten, vanadium, etcetera. I mean all these alloying elements, they are added in order to get a special property for a particular application. Now, if we now let us further classify the plain carbon steel. So, plain carbon steel we will, we will we can classify based on the carbon content. So, we have first of all low carbon steel. In the low carbon steel, carbon content is less than 0 0.25 weight percent. Now, the property that these steels have they have excellent ductility, they possess excellent ductility and uh, toughness. They are also weldable and machinable. But a little bit disadvantage is that they are not amenable to martensitic transformation. It is not amenable, not amenable to martensitic transformation, to martensitic transformation. Now, as regards uses, now, these low carbon steels, they are commonly used say in industrial products like bolts, nuts, sheets, plates and the product derived from there. Another important uh, type of plain carbon steel is the medium carbon steel. The medium carbon steel. Now, in the medium carbon steel, carbon is in between 0 0.25 to 0 
six percent. I will say it is a wet percent. Now, among the properties, these steels have low hardenability. These steels have low hardenability and a very important property that these medium uh, steels possess is that they can be heat treated. They can be heat treated. What does it mean? As I said in the beginning, showing the importance of steel, I said that iron carbon system is capable to create unique property by altering microstructure through heat treatment and deformation processing. So, it is in this connection is medium carbon steel, if they can be heat treated, then you can get from one type of steel several different uh, steels by heat treating them that is simply heating and cooling at different rates. So, that is what the important advantage of medium carbon steel is that they can be heat treated and as a result of heat treatment, uh, several important mechanical or service properties can be induced in the material. Now, these steels are their uses wherever high strength is required. such as machinery, automobile and agricultural parts, gears, axles, connecting rods, all these have uh, medium carbon steel. Now, the third important category in this is high carbon steel. And in the high carbon steel, the carbon varies between 0 0.6 to 1.2 percent carbon. As such, these steels are hardest, I will just put it these steels are hardest, strongest, but at the same time brittle. So, these steels are used where strength and hardness, strength and hardness are simultaneously required. Now, for example, razor blades, cutting tools, music wires and so on so forth. Now, let us see the classification of alloy steels. Now, this alloy among alloy steels, among alloy steel, say we have low alloy steel. In the low alloy steel, the alloying elements are less than 5 weight percent. This is the alloying elements they are less than 5 weight percent. Then we have medium alloy steels, we have medium alloy steels and here the alloying elements vary from 5 to 10 weight percent and then we have high alloy steels and here the alloying elements are greater than 10 weight percent. Now, these alloying elements they are added to improve for example, the properties like hardenability, properties like hardenability, strength, toughness, wear resistance, and to provide for example, stainless property. stainless property. For example, addition of chromium, you get uh, stainless steel, etcetera, etcetera. So, now remember all these alloy steel which I put over here, they have carbon content also. The carbon content may vary, low alloy steel may be 0 0.2, 0 0.3 percent and accordingly the carbon content is also there in all alloy steels. Now, whether we have plain carbon steel 
are alloy steels. All steels they contain the impurities, they all steels contain impurities like sulfur, phosphorus, manganese, silicon, uh, then even nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen and inclusions. These impurities in fact, they originate during the steel making stage, because when you produce steel from hot metal or from pig iron, then these impurities are carried over to the steel, to partially we can remove there uh, from converting uh, hot metal to steel, but still these impurities they enter through the steel making stage. So, what is required is that their content must be controlled for a given application, uh, because these impurities cannot be tolerated in a, in a very large quantity. So, certain applications they require a strict control over the presence of these impurities. Now, I give some example, say for example, if I put here application, I put here application, then I put here impurity level, that is tolerable impurity level and here I put the maximum size of inclusion. Maximum size of inclusion. Now, I am giving you a very few example, rest of the things you can you can see from the books and, uh, and create your knowledge. Say for example, bearings, steels for bearing, they can tolerate the total oxygen, P O I am writing total oxygen should be less than 10 ppm. The inclusion size should not be greater than 15 micron meters, it is very small. Similarly, for application like line pipes, now line pipe sulfur should be less than 30 ppm, nitrogen should be less than 50 ppm and total oxygen should be less than 30 ppm and tolerable inclusion size maximum is 100 micron meter. Now, similarly, if I say wires, such as special wires, here you require nitrogen less than 40 ppm, total oxygen less than 15 ppm and tolerable inclusion size is 20 micron meter. Then automotive, and deep drawing sheets and deep drawing sheets, they have carbon less than 30 ppm and uh, nitrogen also less than 30 ppm and maximum tolerable inclusion size is 100 micron meter. So, what I mean, these are just a few examples. There are many, many examples that require very stringent uh, impurity level control as well as inclusion control. So, just uh, for the illustration purpose, I have given few here, many you can see from the books and see that you are you know these things. Now, in general, if we want to explore the effect of impurities on mechanical properties, because ultimately this steel will be put in application. So, in general, Carbon, it imparts strength. Carbon imparts strength to iron. Remember, pure iron is very ductile and is not useful for any application. But at the same time, carbon reduces ductility. Carbon reduces ductility and impact strength and impact strength. Uh, a very important property that carbon has, it allows to perform heat treatment procedure, to perform 
heat treatment procedure. Now, with this I, I mean and probably you are also clear that heat treatment is one of the main technology to alter the microstructure of the steel and hence to create a different material. Uh, now, regarding another impurity is sulphur. Now, sulphur essentially it causes hard shortness. It causes hard shortness. Now, due to presence of FES at the grain boundary, now the FES has a melting point of 989 degree Celsius. So, when sulphur containing steel is subjected to deformation processing, then we have to heat it. And most of the deforming processing operations require steel to heat above 1000 degree Celsius. So, in that case, the FES, if present at the grain boundary, will melt and will create lot of problems and that is in fact called hot shortness. Now, the formation of this FES can be understood by considering the coefficient of distribution of sulphur between solid and liquid. That is, when you still solidifies, the sulphur segregates because the distribution coefficient, if I put it distribution coefficient which is also called segregation coefficient that is equal to percent sulphur in solid upon percent sulphur in liquid. And this value is around 0 0.02. So, you can imagine if a steel is solidifying from its melting point, any excess amount of sulphur will be rejected because solubility of sulphur in a steel is very low. So, the last liquid which will solidify, it has a very high amount of sulphur and on account of it FES will form and it will precipitate at the grain boundary. So, that is one of the say important effect of sulphur. So, when such steels are heat treated, it may cause tears and cracks, they are developed and another important thing that sulphur forms, they form sulphide inclusions they form sulphide inclusions, they have lower weldability and also corrosion resistance. So, now as regards sulphur, it can be said that except free machining steel that require little high amount of sulphur, none of the grades of steel, they can tolerate the amount of sulphur. Now, similarly about the phosphorus, phosphorus also segregates during solidification its distribution coefficient is also around 0 0.02 with the meaning that during solidification, if excess amount of phosphorus is present, it will also be rejected in the liquid and as a result, the last liquid will solidify, it has a tendency to form Fe 3 P and by virtue of that, it will impair many plastic properties of steel. So, phosphorus in fact, it impairs the plastic property and hence all efforts are done or should be done to remove phosphorus from metal. Say another say further important things are silicon and manganese. Now, silicon it reduces, silicon reduces the drying capacity of steel. the drying capacity of steel. Magnese is beneficial. Why it is beneficial? Because in presence of sulphur, manganese reacts with sulphur and forms manganese sulphide which has a higher melting point. So, this manganese reduces hot shortness, that is the important thing. The presence of gases, for example, nitrogen, it impairs plastic properties. Nitrogen impairs plastic properties. Then hydrogen, it causes say defects, 
such as flakes and etcetera. Presence of oxygen, it forms oxide inclusions. So, the next important thing are the inclusions. They are present at the grain boundary. Inclusions are present, if present at the grain boundary, then they weaken the intra granular bonds. Second, inclusions they also act as stress concentrators. stress concentrators and also some type of inclusions are brittle. So, what will happen if you roll them? So, brittle inclusion will crack and accordingly you will decrack. So, these are say some of the deleterious effects of impurity on the properties of steel. There are several other effects uh, on mechanical properties will be there. I will request you to go through the books and make yourself up to date. Now, in some steels which are produced from scrap, sometimes tramp elements are also present. And these tramp elements are very, very harmful, because they have very low melting point. For example, copper, tin, antimony, lead, zinc, they are all called tramp elements, but they, their source in steel is from the scrap. So, having known an overall blick of steel classification, impurities. Now, let us pursue history of steel making. That is, in fact, now we have to produce it. And the history of steel making now I will say history of say modern steel making. In 1856, Henry Bessemer Henry Bessemer he could develop a process for bulk steel production no heat was supplied from outside because he knew that most of the refining reactions are exothermic in nature what he did he just constructed a pear shaped vessel and uh, lined with acid refractory material and lined with say acid refractory material and through the bottom of the two through the bottom of the vessel he blew air so this is the metal so, through the bottom he blew air and air contained 79 percent nitrogen by volume and and uh, 21 percent oxygen by volume. So, as a result of this the reaction between iron, carbon, silicon, manganese it goes and he was able to produce uh, steel from hot metal. What what was the problem that he envisaged? He could not reduce the phosphorus content of hot metal, because one the lining which has he has put here acid lining. This is the acid lining and this is the hot metal. So, by virtue of the acid lining it was not possible for him to remove phosphorus. So, the problem that he faced is the sulphur and phosphorus could not be removed and the oxygen content of steel was also very high. So, in around 1864, Mouchet has developed for example, iron manganese alloy. Now, with this development, it did become possible to reduce the oxygen content of steel. In around 1878, a basic Bessemer process was developed. A basic Bessemer process was developed. Now, the essential difference between the two, the shape of the vessel is same as I have shown over here. The, all that he has done, instead of acid lining, what basic Bessemer, what this uh, basic Bessemer process did, 
he employed basic lining. That was the only difference. He employed basic lining and as a result of the basic lining, he was able to remove phosphorus from the hot metal. So, with the advent of basic basimer process of steel making, it became possible to reduce phosphorus also. In around 1868, open hearth process was developed. Open hearth process was developed. Now, open heart process, it has a very shallow refractory line tray. I will try to draw, let me see. So, the shallow tray. So, this is the, uh, this is the say uh, refractory lining. All the refractory lining here, acid lining or basic lining, both open heart were developed. So, this I will put as a refractory lining. This is the roof, this is the roof and from here uh, the provision of injecting fuel that is oil burner. This is somewhere here you have the metal and then here is a slag, this I will call as a hot metal and then this is the so called These are the so called regenerators. That is, regenerators were used to preheat the air, and here was an air wall. This is the wall for reversal. That is, in one cycle, here it goes air, preheated air, then here goes exhaust gases out. So, one regenerator on the heating side, another is the cooling side. So, when on heating side, then preheated air passes through this and exhaust gases go through the another uh, out, outlet. So, so that was the whole idea of this employing two regenerators. So, the essential feature of this uh, basic, if this open heart process is that it was a shallow refractory line tray with a roof about it and uh, the charge for this. Now, since heat was being supplied from outside as you seen in the oil burner, so the charge consisted of a steel scrap plus hot metal plus iron ore plus lime. It was introduced through the doors. Source of heat was combustion of gaseous and liquid fuels. Now, since it was possible to use uh, outside source of energy. So, any amount of scrap could be melted. So, the process was highly flexible. The time was around 6 to 8 hours. So, this open heart steel making has dominated the steel production for a very, very long time, because the basic basimer process though solved the problem of phosphorus content of steel, but still the nitrogen content of steel was very high. And because of this, well, People uh, though have used basic basimer in those period, but still open heart process was predominantly used. Now, in around 1900, Paul Herault has showed the use of electricity for steel production. Source of heat was electric energy, bath was shallow, 
but the quality of steel was better than the open heart. The only problem with this, uh, with this uh, electric furnace is that it uses electrical energy, which is a very, very expensive. So, as a result, the electric arc furnace was used for the use of alloy and special steels. In 1950, at Lynch and Donavitz, a process was tried where in a pear shaped vessel, this is the refractory line, this is the hot metal, oxygen was blown from the top, pure oxygen was blown from the top and he was able to convert hot metal to steel and this particular technology has revolutionized the steel industry because it was highly flexible. There was no problem with the plugging of the bottom to it as it was there in basic Bessemer. The only problem is that in the beginning they have used the uh, mild steel as a material of the lance which was melting, but later on the development took place. and. Uh, this process has become the modern steel making. Uh, now, parallel to these developments, the ladle was also explored to use as a reactor and as a result, several secondary steel making processes were also came into existence. So, there are large number of secondary steel making were developed around the 60s and that and in 60s also, this top blown oxygen steel making was converted also to top and bottom blowing steel making. So, that is how the modern steel making through top and bottom steel through top and bottom blowing has come into existence. Now, say for more than 150 years till 1960, ingot casting was the predominant route for casting of liquid steel. In 1960, around that, Continuous, continuous casting has come into existence. A continuous casting of steel was developed and this continuous casting has also revolutionized the steel industry. So, now the present status of steel industry comprises of, for example, we have integrated steel plants. We have integrated steel plants and integrated steel plant, the capacity uh, is they may vary from 1 to 5 million ton per annum. Then we have mini steel plants, we have mini steel plant and their capacity may go from 0.5 to 1 million ton per annum. Now, the essential difference between integrated steel plant and mini steel plant, integrated steel plant, it, can, it starts from ore and produces steel, whereas mini steel plant mostly they have scrap and then to steel. We have long products and flat products. both products are being produced. World steel production, that is the rough idea. World steel production, say in 2007, 2008, in 2007 we have 1.3 billion tons. In 2008, it rose to 1.4 billion tons. Expected projection in the year 2011 is around 1.6 billion ton. Some of the top steel producers, some of the top steel producers say ArcelorMittal, Mittal, 
this data I am giving you for 2007, it has produced 116.4 million tons and it ranked as number 1. Then second was Nippon steel, produced 35.7 million tons and ranked number 2. Then POSCO which is in Korea, it has produced 30.1 and ranked as number 4. Then Tata steel has produced 26.1 million tons and it ranked as number 8. Then Sail Steel Authority of India Limited, it has produced 13.9 and it ranked as number 21. Then first LP which is in Austria, it produced around 6.9 million tons and ranked around 43 is the ranking number. Now just following a short steel making in India, a brief historical background. steel making in India, the first attempt to produce steel in India was made in 1874 when Bengal Iron Works, the Bengal Iron Works came into existence in 1889, Bengal Iron and Steel Company. Bengal Iron and Steel Company has acquired BIW and continues to produce steel until it was taken over by ISCO in 1936. In 1907, Tata Iron and Steel Company was formed and you know by Jamshedji Tata and produced steel and produced steel in 1908 in 1909. In 1918, Mysore government, Mysore government decided a steel plant at Bhadravati. In 1953, through the vision of our late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, an integrated steel plant in public sector at Raurkela. with the German collaboration has come or had come into existence. Since then, Bilai was added, say Bilai in Madhya Pradesh, then came Durgapur, then came Bokaro and then came uh, the Vishakapat, then came another steel plant came in Vishakapatnam. Vishakha Patnam in Andhra Pradesh under Rashtriya Ispat Nigam Limited, RINL, Rashtriya Ispat Nigam Limited. Here also then can alloy steel plant at Durgapur and Salem steel plant, Salem steel plant were also added. The Indian steel industry is organized in three sectors. I put Indian steel industry is organized in three sectors. First, you have integrated plant. Integrated plants, the integrated plants, they make ore, they use ore and produce steel. Now, these integrated steel plants, we have in public sector and we have in private sector. Now in public sector, as I have said already, you have at Raurkela, then Bilai, Durgapur, Bokaro, 
Salem Alloy Steel Plant at Durgapur. Then you have Viswaraya Steel Plant, Viswaraya Iron and Steel Plant at Bhadravati. and iron and steel company at banpur these all they come under a limited company which is called sale which is steel authority of india limited another organization which is rinl rashtri ispat nigam limited under which comes visakhapatnam iron and steel works then we have in private sector we have for example tisco is all of us know tata iron and steel company then we have SR steel plant, then we have Ispath, Ispath Industries, then we have Jindal steel plant, then Jindal uh, steel and power limited and so on. So, this is the one type of uh, plant uh, sector that is integrated sector. Another sector is that the mini steel plant second is the mini steel plant. Now, mini steel plants they use scrap and produce metal. Now, there are several mini steel plants I know I just put down few say Uttami steels is one, Uttami steels, Kalyani steels, Mukund limited, Usha Martin, etcetera. Now, you can add few more, so that to update yourself. This is the second type of sector. Third sector, which has grown in the last 10, 15 years very fast is the induction furnace sector. Now, this sector uses scrap, same thing, scrap and produces steel. Now, this particular sector is dispersed all over the country. Now, the India say in 2007, India has produced 53.1 million tons of steel. In 2007, in 2008, it produced 55.2 million tons of steel. In 2008, it produced 55.2 million tons of steel. Now, India has is rather planning to add steel capacity up to 60 million tons in the future by inviting several steel players, among them. Jindal steel works will be adding 20.6 million tons additional capacity. Then POSCO uh, will add POSCO and Mittal, each will add 12 million tons capacity additional. TISCO will add around 28 million tons additional capacity. If you want further detail, you can see uh, the article by a Chatterjee. It gives various other details, the iron making and steel making, steel making volume 36, number 7, 2009, page 491. So, here, there you can find out several other details. India has a very high growth potential for steel. India has a very high growth potential, very high growth potential. Why? The first per capita consumption of steel, per capita steel consumption. which is considered to be sign of prosperity. India 41 kg per man per year, China 
271 kg per man per year. USA has 404 kg per man per year. The one reason, second reason is that it is expected a very, I mean, uh, economic, a very high economic growth. We expect around 9 to 10 percent economic growth. 9 to 10 percent economic growth in the near future. Now, this calls a tremendous infrastructure growth like building of bridges, roads, railways, airports, highways and what not. So, as such India has a very high growth potential of steel because of these two reasons. If you have also other reasons, please add it and see that India has a very vast scope for growth of steel industry. So, there is going to be a huge demand of steel in the years to come. As per some estimate, by 2030, India will be needing 300 million tons of steel. However, it is an estimate. Now, to conclude this lecture, technology of steel production has made rapid strides in the last few decades. As a result, what happened? Open heart furnace and basic Bessemer, they remain only of historical importance. Today, to my knowledge, none of the plant or very few plant in the world, they are producing steel either by open heart or by basic Bessemer in its original version. As such, the modern steel making comprises of, we have blast furnace, follows by converter steel making, secondary steel making, continuous casting and rolling. This is the route that is followed by integrated steel plants all around the world including India. Another route is that we have the scrap goes in electric arc furnace, then secondary steel making, continuous casting and rolling. Here after the route is same and this is the route followed by the mini steel plants of the world including India. And another route is also followed by scrap used in the induction furnace. And then the manufacturer may sell ingot as such or it may go to secondary steel making or continuous casting and rolling. So, it depends. So, these are the say uh, in conclusion I have to say that the modern steel making comprises of either blast furnace, converter steel making, secondary steel making, continuous casting and rolling or scrap, electric arc furnace and so on. So, as such we will be concentrating on converter steel making and electric arc furnace. Now, before I finish my this lecture, I will like to give you certain questions for your self assessment. So, I will be writing certain questions, the self assessment questions first question is why does steel emerge as an important engineering material. Second question is that what are different types of steel? What are different types of steel, name them and mention few applications.
mention few applications. Third, uh, name the different integrated steel plants in India. Name the different integrated steel plants in India. Mention their capacities. mention their capacities and type of products. Fourth, do you agree that India has a vast potential, India has a vast potential for steel growth justify. Fifth, learn iron carbon diagram and understand the importance of and understands the importance of phases in developing steel properties. Now, the last thing I would like to give you few references for further reading. So, the references for further reading, you can consult one say book by R. H. Tupkari. and V R Tupkari, Modern Steel Making, sixth edition or any edition because I followed the sixth edition. Se second, you can also consider A Ghosh and A Chatterjee. iron making and steel making. That is the end of the lecture.